All right, welcome to the last week in Joshua, and uh, this uh, this week we are going to uh, celebrate faithfulness in uh, in the people of Israel and in their leader. Uh, and uh, then next week we'll jump into Judges, and we will start to see a different story. But let's celebrate while we can the faithfulness uh, here in the scriptures. Um, but it starts with a miscommunication and a assumption, an assumption of. Uh, of ill intent. Um, and so it is amazing how uh, all throughout history, people make assumptions of others. And the Bible, people in the Bible are no different. And so, um, yeah, so let's jump in. We're going to be looking at chapters 22 through 24 uh, and finishing out the book tonight. Uh, and uh, these uh, these three chapters they um, are it's three major events, but they may have happened uh, in you know different chronology than what is recorded here. Is as something that I I read because um, the uh, yeah so there's just a lot of time that spans through this uh, these three chapters up to the death of Joshua, and so like we don't know exactly how much time is between the different events and maybe they were um, flipped around a little bit. So, but that's not really super important because it just captures the events. So chapter 22, starting in verse one says this, then Joshua summoned the Reubenites, the Gadites and the half tribe of Manasseh and said to them, you have done all that Moses, the servant of the Lord commanded and you have obeyed me and everything I commanded. For a long time now, to this very day, you have not deserted your fellow Israelites, but have carried out the mission the Lord your God gave you. Now that the Lord your God has given them rest, as he promised, return to your homes in the land that Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave you on the other side of the Jordan. But be very careful to keep the commandment and the law that Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave you to love the Lord your God, to walk in obedience to him, to keep his commands to hold fast to him and to serve him with all your heart and with all your soul. Then Joshua blessed them and sent them away, and they went to their homes. To the half tribe of Manasseh, Moses had given <clears throat> Moses had given land in Bashan, and the other half of the tribe of Joshua, the other half of the tribe Joshua gave land on the west side of the Jordan, along with their fellow Israelites. When Joshua sent them home, he blessed them, saying, Return to your homes with your great wealth, with large herds of livestock, with silver, gold, bronze, and iron, and a great quantity of clothing, and divide the plunder from your enemies with your fellow Israelites. So the Reubenites, the Gadites, and the half-tribe of Manasseh left the Israelites at Shiloh and Canaan to return to Gilead, their own land, which they had acquired in accordance with the command of the Lord through Moses. When they came to Gel Gelilot, Near the Jordan in the land of Canaan, the Reubenites, the Gadites, and the half tribe of Manasseh built an imposing altar there by the Jordan. When the Israelites heard they had built the altar on, on the border of Canaan at Gelalot, near the Jordan on the Israelite side, the whole assembly of Israel gathered at Shiloh to go to war against them. What? That escalated quickly. So, uh, this, the, the, Last so, several weeks, we've looked at the, the conquest of the land and the distribution of the land to all the tribes. And before they even crossed the Jordan River, the, the people of Reuben, Gad, and half of Manasseh were commanded to join with their brothers in the tribes of Israel as they go and conquer the land. The work has been completed. The distribution of land is done. And so now Joshua says, you, they have entered the rest. Now go home to the land that Moses allowed you to take on the east side of the Jordan River. And um, yeah, and, and prosper there and uh, be blessed. And so they go. Uh, and so all of this is exactly how they should have been doing things. Everything was according to the, the law and the commands of uh that Moses gave to the people before Moses passed away. Um, but as they go, there is a bit of a, a problem because the, the people uh, in Gad, Reuben, and half of Manasseh decide when they 
get to the Jordan River to build a large altar. And it, the text t- tells us it's large, it's imposing. Um, and it's, it is important to note the size of it because it's something that you could see from a distance and uh, from either side of the Jordan River. And so some people are, there's some confusion on where it is when it says on the side of the Israelites. Um, it could be like they could see it from the side of the Israelites or it was built on the west side of the Jordan River. Um, but this altar is an issue um, because the people were only supposed to have one altar to perform sacrifices, and the altar is supposed to be with the tabernacle structure, right? And so the the uh, nine and a half tribes that are on the other, or ten and a half tribes that are on the other side of the on the west side of the Jordan, they see this altar and they're like already they're going to the other side of the Jordan river and they're going to abandon the ways of God. They're going to build their own altar for sacrifices. And so they're making these assumptions. And we all know the classic, uh, the expression, when you assume sometimes you're right, uh, that, but, uh, this is not one of those times because they assumed that they were going to, uh, just turn away from the Lord, do their own thing, but they didn't ask. And right away, they just escalate to, let's go attack them. Let's go to war with them. Now, why would they do that? Well, Moses in the law says, if any of your tribes start to turn away from the Lord, attack them. This is like, you like drive out the wickedness. Um, And so it's not just the wickedness of the nations that the people are supposed to defend against. It's the wickedness of themselves that they also need to be watching out for. And so they are told to go and attack uh, in the law. And so they see this affront to the ways of God. So they start attacking. They gear up for war. So verse 13. So the Israelites sent Phinehas, son of Eleazar, the priest, to the land of Gilead, to Reuben, Gad, and half tribe of Manasseh. With him, they sent 10 of the chief men, one from each of the tribes of Israel, each the, the head of a family division among the Israelite clans. When they went to Gilead, to Reuben, Gad, and the half tribe of Manasseh, they said to them, the whole assembly of the Lord says, how could you break faith with the God of Israel like this? How could you turn away from the Lord and build yourselves an altar in rebellion against him now? Was not the sin of Peor enough for us up to this very day? We have not cleansed ourselves from that sin, even, even though a plague fell on the community of the Lord. And are you now turning away from the Lord? If you rebel against the Lord today, tomorrow he will be angry with the whole community of Israel. If the land you possess is defiled, come over to the Lord's land where the Lord's tabernacle stands and share the land with us. But do not rebel against the Lord or against us by building an altar for yourselves other than the altar of the Lord, our God. When Achan, son of Zerah, was unfaithful in regard to the devoted things, did not wrath come on the whole community of Israel? He was not the only one who died for his sin. And so the, the people are preparing for war, but first, first they send, uh, they send Phineas, the son of the high priest. And um, so because this is a, uh, this is an offense that is religious in nature. They send a representative of the, the religious system uh, and the tribe to go and try to broker peace first before they actually start attacking. And so they send Phineas across. And Phineas, if we remember all the way back, he, he refers to the, uh, the, the plague at Peor. Now, Peor is where Balaam, the prophet, uh, had convinced Balak, the king of Moab, to uh, instead of being able to curse the people, Balaam couldn't curse them because the Lord won't allow him to curse the people of Israel. But Balaam suggested that, hey, why don't you send over some of your women to entice the men of Israel? And it worked. And, and Phineas brought an end to the pl- plague that the Lord disciplined the people with uh, by stabbing a man who was bringing uh, the woman into his tent in front of everybody, stabbing them through with a spear. And that brought an end to the, end to the plague. It's a brutal story. Um, but it was also th- another sign of the, 
uh, the disobedience of some causing a ill effect on the whole community. And so Phineas uh, at the Battle of Peor ended the plague. Uh, the, so here he brings that up again, like we are still dealing with the, the fallout from this. We are still like wrestling with this kind of impurity. And here you're building your own religious system. And then he also gives another example uh, with Achan. And as we remember, Achan stole a robe and some silver from, from Jericho. And so then uh, they went to Ai and were defeated uh, at Ai um, because of Achan's sin. And so he's saying, look, we, we don't want your uh, rebellion to create a problem for the whole community. And so keep this in mind. What you do affects other people is what, they're, what Phineas is saying here. Uh, but then he also says, if it is too hard to be on the east side, if the land you're on is defiled, then come over to the west side of the Jordan. Be with us. Don't separate yourself from us, but come closer. And so Phineas is known for his zeal, known for being willing to do hard uh, things to, uh, uh, to honor the Lord and get people to come to repent, to come back on track. Um, but he, he isn't doing that here so much as he's inviting them to reconcile, okay? And so he goes to investigate to see what is going on and um, also inviting them to come back into right relationship with Israel and with the Lord because this, this, this altar is troubling. And so verse 21, then Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh Reply to the heads of the clans of Israel, the mighty one, God, uh, the mighty one, God, the Lord, the mighty one, God, the Lord, he knows. And let Israel know if this has been in rebellion or disobedience to the Lord, do not spare us this day. If we have built our own altar to turn away from the Lord and to offer burnt offerings and grain offerings or to sacrifice fellowship offerings on it, may the Lord himself call us to account. No, we did did it for fear that someday our descendants might say to you, your descendants might say to ours, what do you have to do with the Lord, the God of Israel? The Lord has made the Jordan a boundary between us and you. You Reubenites and Gadites, you have no share in the Lord. So your descendant might cause ours to stop fearing the Lord. That is why we said, let us get ready. Let us get ready and build an altar but not for burnt offerings or sacrifices. On the contrary, it is to be a witness between us and you and the generations that follow, that we will worship the Lord at his sanctuary with our burnt offerings, sacrifices, and fellowship offerings. Then in the future, your descendants will not be able to say to ours, you have no share in the Lord. And we said, if they ever say this to us or to our descendants, we will answer, look at the replica of the Lord's altar, which our ancestors built not for burnt offerings and sacrifices, but as a witness between us and you. Far be it from us to rebel against the Lord and turn away from him today by building an altar for burnt offerings, grains of offerings, and sacrifices other than the altar of the Lord our God what's, that stands before this tabernacle. When Phineas the priest and the leaders of the community, the heads of the clans of the Israelites, heard what Reuben, Gad, and Manasseh had to say, they were pleased. And Phineas, son of Eleazar the priest, said to Reuben, Gad, and Manasseh, Today we know that the Lord is with us, because you have not been unfaithful to the Lord in this matter. Now you have rescued the Israelites from the Lord's hand. Then Phineas, the son of Eleazar the priest, and the leaders returned to Canaan from their meeting with the Reubenites and Gadites in Gilead and reported to the Israelites. They were glad to hear the report and praised God. And they talked no more about going to war against them to devastate the country where the Reubenites and the Gadites lived. And the Reubenites and Gadites gave the altar a name, a witness between us that the Lord is God. So they did, they explained themselves. Uh, the Reubenites and the Gadites and half tribe of Manasseh say like, we built this not to worship God separately from the tabernacle. We, we want to do that, but this is a sign to you and your descendants, that we are on the same team. We, we do not want to create a distance between us. Already, the river, the Jordan River, is going to be a barrier, a natural barrier between the tribes, 
And so they want to, um, they want to maintain a, an identity with the people on both sides of the river. Could there have been a better way to do this? Yeah, probably. But this seemed like a good idea at the time to the people uh, in Gad, Reuben, and half of Manasseh. Uh, and this is enough to convince the people, uh, to con convince Phineas and the elders of the people of Israel that um, they're not trying to do their own thing. They were never going to try to offer any sacrifices on that. So they weren't trying to turn away from the Lord and do their own worship system. And so this appeases the people. Now, the, the Jordan River is going to be that barrier. It is going to be something that will cause distance between the people. Um, but it didn't, it, doesn't, it didn't have to be. And I think one of the important implications for us as we read passages like this uh, when we are stepping into conflict, and I know it's not like a direct correlation, like you're not going to war with uh, your neighbor, like a literal war, but when we're stepping into conflict, like we should come to them with questions and an invitation to reconcile. If there is a distance that is being created between people, uh, being the first to offer reconciliation is something that we should strive to do. Um, and so that's, that's something we can uh, hold on to uh, from, from this passage is like, you know, let's figure out what's going on. Don't just assume that we know what's going on. Don't assume the worst, um, but work through uh, the, the conflict together. And I love the way that the people of Reuben and Gad and Manasseh respond is like, they say, the Lord, our God, the mighty, well, the Lord, our God, the mighty one, like they like are emphasizing, like, no, we really are trying to serve God faithfully. And in this point of their history, like that is their heart is the same with the heart of the people on the West side. They have seen God's hand. They have seen his provision. They have seen his miracles. Uh, and so they want to hold on to that and be unified uh, between the two sides. And so while we no longer are uh, bound by these, these kinds of altars and limitations to a single place, um, I do think there are things even in churches where we should, uh, you know, when there are conflicts or differences between churches, find ways to uh, act with greater compassion and seeking to understand uh, other communities more than just saying, well, they're just the worst because they're different than us. They're on the other side of town. That church on the other side of Highway 99, oh no, they're no good. Uh, but to like find ways to build bridges to build relationship. And so, um, yeah, so that was the last major conflict in the book of Joshua. And it wasn't with one of the other nations. It was with the people of it. It was between the people of Israel itself, but it was unified or, or it was resolved. I should say chapter 23, then Joshua begins his farewells here. And so to 23 verse one says, after a long time had passed and the Lord had given Israel rest from all their enemies around them, Joshua, by then a very old man, summoned all Israel, their elders, leaders, and judges and officials and said to them, I am very old. I, it's exciting when you like get up in age and you can just start your speeches like, I get it. I'm old. I am very old. You yourselves have seen everything that the Lord your God has done to all these nations for your sake. It was the Lord your God. Who fought for you. Remember how I have allotted as an inheritance for your tribes all the land of the nations that remain, the nations I conquered between the Jordan and the Mediterranean Sea in the West. The Lord your God himself will push them out for your sake. He will drive them out before you, and you will take possession of their land as the Lord your God promised you. Be very strong. Be careful to obey all that is written in the book of the law of Moses without turning aside to the right or to the left. Do not associate with these nations that remain among you. Do not invoke the names of their gods or swear by them. You must not serve them or bow down to them, but you are to hold fast to the Lord your God as you have until now. The Lord has driven out before you great and powerful nations. To this day, no one has been able to withstand you. One of you routes a thousand because the Lord your God fights for you just as he promised. So be very careful to love the Lord your God. 
um, and so here, as Joshua is wrapping up his leadership, his, his season of, of leading the people of Israel, um, he starts giving this speech, um, talking a, about the Lord's intervention and power on their behalf. Um, and so when he's talking about, remember how I have a lot of his inheritance for you, the tribes, like it's really the Lord that he's speaking on behalf of. Because remember, the allotment was determined by lots. And so they, uh, they were handing over these decisions to God's providence and sovereignty. And so they, uh, so he's saying, remember how I drove out the nations? Remember how I allotted uh, the land to you? Uh, I've done these things. And now be careful to obey all that I have commanded you in the law. And one of the things when we think about the law is, um, you know, the law is a response to God's rescuing work. God started the relationship with Israel by, by calling Abraham. Abraham didn't get a bunch of law and then God said, all right, now I will follow you. No, God called Abraham and commanded him to go to the land. And then when they were rescued from, Israel, from Egypt, God rescued them first before giving them the law, saying, look, I, have, I can provide for you. I have a plan for you. And these are my commands that you would walk in this path of life. And so following the law is something that is a response to how God provided for the people first. And so um, looking at all the victories that the people have experienced where the Lord has um, seen fit to bring them into this place um, is, is a reminder to say, look what all I've done. Now, trust me, <laughs> trust me is essentially what the Lord is speaking through uh, Joshua here. Um, and as he is calling, like t reminding them, like the faithfulness to the Lord will sustain you in the land. Faithfulness to the Lord will sustain you uh, from other nations trying to attack is what God ultimately wants to communicate in this moment through Joshua, but Joshua continues to say, what if you turn away and ally yourself, yourselves with the survivors of these nations that remain among you? And if you intermarry with them and associate with them, then may you may be sure that the Lord, your God will no longer drive out these nations before you. Instead, they will become snares and traps for you, whips on your backs and thorns in your eyes until you perish from this good land, which the Lord your God has given you. And then now Joshua says, now I'm about to go the way of all the earth. You know, with all your heart and soul, that not one of all the good promises the Lord your God gave you has failed. Every promise has been fulfilled. Not one has failed. But just as the good things the Lord your God has promised you have come to you, so he will bring on you all the evil things he has threatened until the Lord your God has destroyed you from this good land. He has given you if you violate the covenant of the Lord, your God, which he commanded you and go and serve other gods and bow down to them. The Lord's anger will burn against you and you will quickly perish from the good land he has given you. So the first section of this, this speech is look at all the good things God has done. And, you know, so don't tie your hearts to the, the nations uh, around you. Don't tie your hearts to their idols. And like the reason why intermarrying in this situation was such a big deal was because that was one of the ways that they would bring idolatry from the nations into their homes, into their families. Um, and so it was a, it was a call to purity. Now there are people, and these people are wrong, who would look at a passage like this and say, well, this is an indication that people like interracial marriage is not okay. That's not what this is about at all. That's not the goal uh, in what uh, Joshua is saying here. It's not about interracial marriage. It's about uh, trying to practice a syncretism of religion. And, and so we can look at this and say, like, look, if you are uh, wanting to get married, you should marry somebody who is also a believer, like today. Like, if you are looking to have a relationship, like, look for Christian men and women to, to be in relationship with and to marry them because this a divided house 
is going to create a struggle for you uh, and can lead to unfaithfulness in your own walk with the Lord. And so this is what he is trying to communicate, like stay faithful to the Lord from the government all the way to the family unit, like stay faithful. Um, and so as he's saying, like, I'm about to, I'm about to die. I'm about to go all the way of the earth. Everything on the earth uh, deteriorates over time. And, and the people know this. And so he's saying like, every promise God has made, he has kept. And so that goes both ways, the good and the bad. So if you've seen the promises, the good promises, as you've been faithful, remember, that's the path of life. But also remember, God, when we, when the people confirmed the covenant on Mount Ebal, they read the blessings and the curses. And, and so all those curses that God said would come upon the people, if they disobey, like God keeps his promises. And, and so Joshua is trying to help them understand that there are high stakes uh, for their faithfulness, but the faithfulness ideally should be, um, it should be easy for them because they have seen all of God's faithfulness so far. And so the, the Ebenezer stone that they raised that said, thus far, the Lord has helped us. That's one of those things that should be, they should look at those, those stones, uh, th those altars, those um, the stones, even like from the Jordan River, as they crossed over, they should look at all of these monuments. When they walk by the ruins of Jericho, they should be able to say, this is what the Lord has done. And the faithfulness of God is something that should sustain them into the future. But when we forget the faithfulness of God, we start to see, ask questions like, well, what has the Lord done for us lately? And we start to drift away. Excuse me. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, we, uh, finished the furnaces and the, the HVAC in my side of the building. And so they are, they're on, there's heat in my office, but it's also kind of burning off some new, new furnace stuff. So a little less sneezy. Uh, so, um, yeah, so that's, uh, as we then are, as Joshua is calling them to be faithful, chapter 24 then is, um, it's another moment of confirmation. So chapter 23 Joshua brought the leaders of the people essentially and said, listen, this is what's happening. Um, and I want you as leaders to carry on the faithfulness for the people, pass on what God has done. And so then um, in chapter 24, he summons all the tribes of Israel and the elders and leaders in particular to come uh, present and represent before the people, before the Lord. So 24 says, uh, then Joshua assembled all the tribes of Israel at Shechem. He summoned the elders, leaders, judges, and officials of Israel, and they presented himself, themselves before the Lord. Uh, Joshua said to all the people, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. Long ago, your ancestors, including Terah, the father of Abraham, and Nahor, lived beyond the Euphrates River and worshiped others, other gods. But I took your father Abraham from the land beyond the Euphrates and led him through throughout Canaan and gave him many descendants. I gave him Isaac, and to Isaac I gave Jacob and Esau. I assigned the hill country of Seir to Esau, but Jacob and his family went down to Egypt. Then I sent Moses and Aaron, and I afflicted the Egyptians by what I did there, and I brought you out. When I brought your people out of Egypt, you came to the sea, and the Egyptians pursued them with chariots and horsemen as far as the Red Sea. But they cried out to the Lord for help, and he put darkness between you and the Egyptians. He brought the sea over them and covered them. You saw with your own eyes what I did to the Egyptians. Then you lived in the wilderness for a long time. I brought you to the land of the Amorites who lived east of the Jordan. They fought against you, but I gave them into your hands. I destroyed them from before you, and you took possession of their land. When Balak, son of Zippor, the king of Moab, prepared to fight against Israel, he sent Balaam, son of Beor, to put a curse on you, but I would not li listen to Balaam. So he blessed you again and again, and I delivered you out of his hand. 
Then you crossed the Jordan River and came to Jericho. The citizens of Jericho fought against you, as did also the Amorites, Perizzites, Canaanites, Hittites, Girgashites, Hivites, and Jebusites. But I gave them into your hands. I sent the hornet ahead of you, which drove them out before you. Also, the two Amorite kings, you did not do it with your own sword and bow. So I gave you a land on which you did not toil and cities you did not build, and you live in them and eat from vineyards and olive groves that you did not plant. And so again, Joshua, he's getting ever closer to the end of his life, and he is summing up the history of the people of Israel because our history helps us for the present. It helps us to stay faithful for the future as we remember God's providence and provision in the past. And But he starts here at Shechem, going all the way back to Abraham. Now, Shechem is important because when we, if you remember, when we were back in the, um, in the book of Genesis, uh, at Shechem is where Jacob buried all of the idols of the people of, uh, of his household because he had an encounter with God. And, uh, and remember uh, in Bethel, which is not far from here, he saw that the ladder going up and down with angels descending. He said, this is the house of the Lord. And so he comes back to this area and he buries all of the, all of the idols from, the, the, from his family uh, back on the other side of the Euphrates, where his, his wives, Leah and, and, uh, and Rachel come from. Uh, and so they had idols that they brought with them. So he buries them. So they're turning away from the gods of, of Nahor uh, and the people b- beyond the Euphrates River. And so it's at this place in Shechem where, where Joshua is calling the people back to, uh, to hold on to that faithfulness. And he's going to get a little bit more into that later. Um, and so going through the history of all that God has done and liberating them from the Egyptians and the, the different kings along the way as they were trying to get to the promised land, how God uh, brought them victory after victory. And it wasn't their own strength. It was God power working with them. Even when Balaam tried to curse them, the Lord made it so Balaam could not curse them, but only bless them. And he even says here, like, when, I, when you went into the land, I sent the hornet ahead of you. And... Um, as I was reading, there's a lot of people who had a different theories about the Hornet and maybe even saying like, oh, it was Egypt. Uh, and Egypt was actually also fighting them, these nations. And that might be why they were weaker, but that doesn't make really any sense um, because Egypt uh, is not present in any of the conquest narratives in the book of Joshua. Um, and so when he's talking about a Hornet here, what we should understand is like confusion. Uh, the Lord sent the maybe literal hornets to confuse people from time to time, or a spirit of confusion. And even when we read some of this, the ways that the people uh, in these nations um, they tried to fight, but they were so defeated, it's like because they were confused, because they were overwhelmed, because they were frustrated. All these things that, like, if you were uh, attacked by a, a a what is it, a horde of hornets? It's not a flock of hornets. What it and uh, a collection of hornets. Um, if you are like have a bunch of hornets pestering you, like you are going to have a hard time like being able to think about anything other than I'm getting stung a bunch. It's kind of like in that uh, that scene in Tommy Boy, uh, where uh, in order to a swarm, thank you, Christy, uh, <laughs> a swarm of hornets uh, when uh, Tommy and Richard are being pulled over. Um, and uh, Tommy's solution to get uh, to avoid the uh, the police is to come like say run out of the car and just yell that you're being attacked by bees and like freak out and flail and that kind of stuff. That's what the Lord did to all of the the nations in the Promised Land. They were being attacked by bees, um, and so He's saying all of these things I did for you, Israel. The Lord did this, and not just defeated your enemies, but then. You moved into their cities. You moved into their, their farmlands and all of the vineyards that they planted. You started to reap the harvest uh, from their vineyards, from their 
their orchards, from their fields. Like that was God providing for them. And so all of these things God has done for them. And so they need to uh, remember his faithfulness and hold on to that as they move into this next chapter for the people of Israel. And so, uh, like I said, they're doing this at Shechem, which is where Jacob buried the idols. And so verse 14, uh, Joshua calls them to respond. Now fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods of your, your ancestors worship beyond the Euphrates River and in Egypt and serve the Lord. But if serving the Lord seems unbearable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Then the people answered, far be it from us to forsake the Lord to serve other gods. It was the Lord our God himself who brought us out, us and our parents up out of Egypt from that land of slavery and performed those great signs before our eyes. He protected us in our entire journey and among all the nations through which we traveled. And the Lord drove out before us all the nations, including the Amorites who lived in the land. We too will serve the Lord because he is our God. Joshua said to the people, you are not able to serve the Lord. He is a holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your rebellion and your sins. If you forsake the Lord and serve foreign gods, he will turn and bring disaster on you and make an end of you after he has been good to you. But the people said to Joshua, no, we will serve the Lord. Then Joshua said, you are witnesses against yourselves that you have chosen to serve the Lord. Yes, we are witnesses, they replied. Now then, said Joshua, throw away the foreign gods that are among you and yield your hearts to the Lord, the God of Israel. And the people said to Joshua, we will serve the Lord our God and obey him. On that day, Joshua made a covenant for the people. And there at Shechem, he reaffirmed for them uh, decrees and laws. And Joshua recorded these things in the book of the law of God. Then he took a large stone and set it up there under the oak near the holy place of the Lord. See, he said to all the people, this stone will be a witness against us. It has heard all the words the Lord has said to us. It will be a witness against you if you are untrue to your God. So this is a, a renewal of the covenant uh, ceremony. And as part of these kinds of uh, covenant documents in the ancient world, there is a history. And then there is a call to action of trust for the, between the two covenant partners. Uh, and then there are vows of commitment. And so this is uh, following that similar progression uh, in this um, in this passage. And so um, this call to throw away the, the, the gods of their ancestors on the other side of the, river, the Euphrates, the gods from the Egyptians, the gods from the Amorites, the nations living among them. Like, as I read this, one of the things that stands out is like, he's telling them to throw these idols away because they are present in the community. Like there are things that they're, they were picking up along the way, things that they were already saying like, well, it's okay to have a little bit of, a little bit of uh, these statues around. But this is like the, in the top 10 commandments. I am the Lord your God. You shall have no other gods before me. Do not worship any graven image. All of these things, like the Lord is calling them to trust him. And here, as Joshua is stepping out, knowing he is going to pass away. He's like, you, you have to stay faithful to the Lord. So throw them away. So they went on this field trip to Shechem, to the place where Jacob buried the idols and say, this is where we're going to bury these idols. This is where we're going to get rid of this now. And so commit to the Lord now. And in this uh, first paragraph here in, in uh, verse, uh, verse 15, you know, it says, if it is too hard to serve the Lord, then, you know, God is sees you, but as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. It's not Joshua saying like, I am better than you, but saying like, we are making a decision. My household is deciding to do this. And I want you also to decide to do this, to, to decide to follow the Lord and not to pursue these other idols. And they say, we will do it. We will trust, uh, we will trust the Lord. 
and, and turn from all these other things. We recognize God's faithfulness. Um, but there's still a warning. There's still a warning. If you fail to do this, the Lord will destroy you. Uh, and uh, there are, this is a bit of a prophetic word here with Joshua saying, like knowing the fickleness of the people and knowing that there will be a day where God will take them out of the land and place them in exile in the Persian empire and the Babylonian empire and the, the Assyrian empire, all of these different nations will take the people out of Israel, out of the land that God had promised for a season because of their disobedience. And so we see even before uh, the people are like really comfortable in the land, right? They just, they're, they're receiving the rest, but it is, they're just getting started. And Joshua's already saying, you're not going to make it. You're going to disobey. Um, and, and this is heartbreaking as I read this, knowing the whole story, knowing that they will have failure after failure after failure, but also knowing how, how long suffering the Lord is. Because when we read through Judges and the historical books with the kings, it takes a long time before the Lord actually says, like, all right, that's enough. I'm removing you from the land. And, um, yeah, but here they're, they're, they're making a vow. And so as part of the vow, the, uh, Joshua builds this or erects this large stone as a monument at, by this oak. And these holy places uh, often are connected to trees in some way or another. Uh, trees are natural, you know, they grow from the earth and they reach up to the heavens. And so they're never supposed to worship trees. But when we look in, in, the, in the, the, the book of Genesis, there's the Oaks of Mamre and, there, and like, there's these tree places. The Garden of Eden had trees. And so trees were intended to be signs to the people of like reaching up to the heavens. Um, and, and so that here at Shechem, where there's this tree, where there's this history of turning away from idols, he builds a monument that's like this stone, while the stone is not a, you know, a sentient being is like this stone, God's creation has heard what you've said, has heard your commitment. And this stone will serve as a witness against us. If we are faithful, unfaithful to the Lord. And so they say, we will do this. We will do this. And, uh, and so we, we end this passage or this book with a bit of optimism here. The people are in the land. They're enjoying the rest. They are recommitting their lives and their, their families to faithfulness to follow the Lord. And so in verse 28, then Joshua dismissed the people each to their own inheritance. After these things, Joshua, son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110, and they buried him in the land of his inheritance at Timnath Sarah, in the hill country of Ephraim, north of Mount Kaash. So there's three, there's essentially three, uh, three funerals here, two funerals and a burial. Um, and the first one is Joshua, and you know he's buried on his land. All this stuff, this makes sense. There's two key details that we need to note. First, uh, the Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord. This is the first time in this book that Joshua is called the servant of the Lord. So far, that phrase has only been associated with Moses. And so it's at his death that Joshua is able to say, like, well done, like he's done a good job. He has served God faithfully. And, uh, well, you know, when we read the, the scriptures, we uh, have this promise of the, from the Lord that when we enter into eternity, he will say, well done, good and faithful servant. And so this, this servant of the Lord is, an, is a wonderful title. It's a wonderful honor. Uh, and so it's been associated with only Moses and now Joshua, servant of the Lord. And he lived to be 110. Now, Moses, in, uh, when he passed away, was 120. Joshua, 110, also the same age as Jacob, who we just read, had this uh, encounter at Shechem. And so there's all these ties together to um, the promise of God, to the land, to faithfulness. Uh, these are all intentionally highlighted in this passage. The next uh, note here, uh, 
Israel served the Lord throughout the lifetime of Joshua and of the elders who outlived him and who had experienced everything the Lord had done for Israel. And so the generation of Joshua helped the people to stay faithful to the Lord. Um, and so they were able to say, I saw, I saw what God did. I saw how he rescued us. I saw all of his faithfulness again and again and again. And so they were able to keep people close to faithfulness. Uh, verse 32, and Joseph's bones, which the Israelites had brought up from Egypt, were buried at Shechem in the tract of land that Jacob bought for a hundred pieces of silver from the sons of Hamor, the, son, the father of Shechem. This became the inheritance of Joseph's descendants. And so at Shechem, they finally bury Joseph's bones. Now, if you read back all the way in Genesis, uh, the, as the book is ending, jo the, Jacob dies and the, they go and they bury him here at Shechem. Uh, and Joseph told the people, like, when I die, don't leave me here in Egypt, but bury me in my father's land, in my father's tomb. And so this is a, this is like a cap of the faithfulness. Like we honored our heritage. We, we brought Joseph home and the, it's just a really beautiful moment here because Joseph, uh, his brothers were the ones who sent him to Egypt as they sold him into slavery, but his descendants also were, were, were faithful to bring him back home. And I, I love that when this, sometimes the journey that life takes us on is long and difficult and, and we don't know how we're going to get to where we feel like God wants us to be. Um, it, but there is a legacy of faithfulness that, that there are, there may be people down the road, hundreds of years after our lives that, that are impacted by, by what we have done, uh, as we have been faithful to the Lord. Um, that will honor the legacy that, that maybe we don't, we never saw, we couldn't understand all that God was going to do. Um, but yeah, there's those, this, these kinds of moments where they buried Joseph, they, they honored his, his, his wishes there. And then finally, and Eliezer, son of Aaron died and was buried at Gibeah, which had been allotted to his son Phineas in the whole country of Ephraim. And so the high priest Eliezer uh, died. And uh, with the death of the high priest, there was a uh, there would be the ordination of a new high priest. So Phineas would finally step into that role. Uh, but then also uh, when we were talking about the, the cities of refuge, that was when people who were uh, fleeing to the cities of refuge for protection, uh, the death of the high priest meant that they could go home after accidental uh, manslaughter of somebody. And so then they could go home after the death of the high priest. Uh, but so we have this generation of faithfulness uh, in Joshua and Eliezer that are, they have passed. And so we then transition into a, uh, the next chapter for the people of Israel. And we turn the page to Judges. And so next week we'll be uh, in Judges. And there's going to be some overlap between uh, the first section of Judges and the lifespan of Joshua. So like, it's not just like, and then the next day, this stuff in Judges happened. They, they overlap a bit. And we're going to read a little bit about Joshua's death again. Um, but yeah, so it's, uh, yeah, so there, there is the life and, and leadership of Joshua and Eliezer. Uh, concluded in uh yeah in chapter 24 so uh any questions i did see that there was a chat what is the book of god's instruction uh megan good question uh the book of god's instruction is, is most likely the scroll of the covenant that like uh that the lord uh instructed them to write so it's most likely like what we have as deuteronomy is what this what they're probably referring to there, um, Deuteronomy is the second giving of the law, and it was essentially like Moses's last sermon. And so Joshua probably could have added some things there to some a scroll like that, um, just to kind of sum up the the history from Moses's death to through to the people of Israel at this time. So, yeah, but the kings were supposed to also write for themselves their own copy of the law. That was one of the instructions that Moses gave in Deuteronomy. And so while they don't have a king yet, um, 
I don't see why, I mean, nobody said this in the commentaries, but I don't see why Joshua wouldn't also, as a leader of the people, have taken the time to write out the law. Like, so he might have his own like handwritten copy of, uh, of all that Moses taught them uh, in the law. So, yeah. Uh, do you know why there wasn't a passing of the torch from Joshua, like with Moses? Yeah. You know, Joshua, we don't read anything about Joshua's descendants or his kids. And so Moses, um, Mo Moses had sons, but they were not the ones that were called up to follow after him. Uh, and instead the Lord appointed Joshua God's design. Uh, Tony, this is like a really great question. God's design in, in, for the people of Israel, it seems, is that they would let him be their king, that the priests would carry the leadership of the people because they would, uh, they would not need um, a strong military leader because they should be faithful to the Lord and the Lord would fight for them. And so the priests then are the ones that would be the de facto leaders of the people as they lead them, not in military conquest, but in worship. And so we have that as our primary uh, chain of inheritance that should lead to faithfulness. Um, and so we, in Judges, we don't see a continuation from Joshua's leadership. Um, and even then we see these different events and episodes from the book of Judges from different tribes because the tribes then were elders and leaders uh it, tribe to tribe and they were you know kind of on their own so it's it's not unlike the um early you know early american experiment here uh where before we had a president we had the continental congress and we had the um the we had leaders from state to state so governors were more powerful than the congress because every state had their own rights um and so it wasn't until we actually like had developed the, the the constitution and what the government was actually going to look like in our country uh that we actually then had a president and uh and the senate and the, all the different structures of our government um judges was that same kind of like confederation of tribes instead of a centralized government that would uh, rule over all of Israel. But the people wandered and we're going to see again and again in judges in those days, Israel had no King and everybody did what they saw fit in their own eyes, which is not good <laughs> for people when we just want to do our own thing. So yeah, good question, Tony. That was, that was a great question. Any other questions or thoughts on these three chapters all right it was nice to get out of all of the land distribution week after week so it's nice to have some like things happening and some teaching like that was nice it was a good good change of pace <laughs> so <laughs> what was that some real action. Yeah, some real action of an almost war and then some talking. <laughs> <laughs> so it's kind of like a Star Wars episode one. A lot of a lot of senatorial <laughs> things. <laughs> so <Yeah. laughs> but still better than nothing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Um any other questions or thoughts? Thanks very much, Jason. Uh, well, thank you for uh, for joining tonight. Um, I, uh, like I said last week, I am really excited for Judges. It's my favorite book. It's the reason I love the Bible. And so, um, I was talking to somebody this past week. Maybe it was with Kate. Uh, because we we're, we're doing a read through the Bible podcast thing. And maybe it was in that, but I have wanted to do a sermon series in judges um, because I just love this book so much, but it's, it's one of those things where um, like when you have like a really favorite movie 
and like you're dating somebody and you're like, I want you to watch this movie with me because it's so important to me. And then you're nervous that they won't like it. And so you don't like the, it's like you're, it kind of ruins the experience. And so like part of this, like why we haven't done a series in judges is because I it's like, what if, what if the people of Creekside don't, don't love this book as much as I do. And I, so, uh, so book by book gives me an opportunity to not try to like preach it as much as teach through it and talk about it. And so I'm just so excited. It's going to be great. Um, so I hope, uh, yeah, I do hope that you enjoy it. It's a weird book. It is so weird. It is so weird. So, um, but that's usually where the fun stuff in the Bible is, is in the weird. So, um, <laughs> yeah. All right. Well then let's, uh, let's wrap it up then for tonight. And, uh, we will be back, uh, next week in judges. Um, and, um, yeah, I'll, uh, see, I hope to see you on, on Sunday. And if I don't, I'll see you on Wednesday. So talk to y'all later. Thanks, mate. All, All right. right. Bye.